This is Curative Design, and I'm Arun Matthews. One of my favorite types of stories in medical history are those in which innovation blossoms as the result of two disciplines intersecting. Take, for instance, Charles Lindbergh, who many remember as the definition of a true aviator, successfully making one of the first transatlantic crossings in a single-seat, single-engine, purpose-built Ryan monoplane dubbed the Spirit of St. Louis. He did this in 1927, at the age of 25. In the years that followed, he became virtually a household name, a paragon of American ingenuity at the time. And while there are so many aspects of his life that would merit further discussion, the thing that I'm hoping to talk about today would be his contributions to medicine, specifically vascular surgery and transplant medicine. It's written that while on his various record-breaking flights, he would have a great deal of time to ponder the nature of life and death. In 1930, he had the opportunity to see this firsthand as his wife's sister developed heart complications from having rheumatic fever as a child. What happens is that in learning how to fight the bacteria, specifically group A streptococci, that causes rheumatic fever, our immune system becomes fooled into thinking that other parts of the body contain these bacterial proteins. This process is called molecular mimicry. Tragically, these similar appearing proteins are often found in the heart and joints, resulting in inflammation and damage to both of these areas. In the heart, this inflammation can be particularly severe, leading to damage of the heart valves especially the large mitral and aortic valves. In advanced cases, surgeons are able to replace these valves with artificial ones, but this is only with the aid of something called a cardiopulmonary bypass machine. This is essentially a machine that does the work of the heart and lungs, keeping the rest of the body alive while the surgeon is repairing a non-beating heart. Unfortunately, in the 1930s, such a machine had not been invented yet. Many would argue that Lindbergh's work to try and save his sister-in-law would result in the foundational technology for what would actually soon become the cardiopulmonary bypass machine. Charles Lucky Lindbergh was not only a pioneer in aviation, but also what I would describe as an aviator in healthcare, meaning that his contributions would go on to have a lasting legacy in this particular field of medicine called perfusion science. So, place yourself in Lindbergh's shoes. You helped design and construct a single-engine Ryan monoplane that would become your home for a 30-plus hour historic flight from New York to Paris. You are used to designing things that you routinely place your life into the hands of. Some of these things included pumps and valves. And here is this doctor telling you that the reason your sister-in-law is going to die is because she has a faulty valve in the pump that happens to be her heart and that there was nothing anyone could do about it. Challenge accepted. Undaunted, Lindbergh visited a few more physicians who all told him the same thing. You see, for Lindbergh, the consummate driven engineer, the solution was simple. Create a mechanism to allow for either the heart and lungs to be bypassed and then fix the faulty valves or perhaps more radically, replace the heart altogether. You certainly had to admire the young man's audacity. He finally met a physician that took his notion seriously, who said that the only person that could possibly help him was a vascular surgeon by the name of Alex Carell. Carell was a French biologist and surgeon who had developed a pioneering suturing technique of large vessels that subsequently earned him the Nobel Prize in Physiology in 1912. By the 1930s, he was running his own lab at the Rockefeller Institute and on a whim decided to take a meeting with the aviator slash celebrity Charles Lindbergh. I believe that individuals at the top of their game in a particular field are naturally drawn to similar acts of greatness in other fields. I suspect that this is in fact what led this most peculiar of working partnerships. Lindbergh, the driven engineer trying to find a cure for his declining sister-in-law, and Carell, the brilliant surgeon scientist that was trying to build a path to immortality by the notion of organ transplantation and preservation. 
For the next six years, Lindbergh would conduct with Carell in research that would ultimately result in the development of a revolutionary perfusion pump. Carell, with his basic science and biology background, perfected a nutrient-rich medium that would bathe and perfuse the organ. What he lacked, however, was the knowledge of fluid mechanics and engineering that would allow for a steady, gradual pressure that needed to be maintained, effectively mimicking the motion of a beating heart. This was where Lindbergh's expertise in designing oil pumps would come in. Lindbergh designed a complex three-chambered glass pump apparatus whose genius lay in a rotating glass valve that allowed for this rhythmic pressure gradient. Ultimately, the pump would reliably allow for the perfusion of animal organs outside of the body for periods as long as 21 days. This work would be described in the book they co-authored called The Culture of Organs, and they would go on to share the cover of Time magazine in 1938. Unfortunately, Lindbergh's sister-in-law would die of her heart condition during this time, but there is little doubt that the science of external organ perfusion was now well on its way. To this very day, the basic mechanism of this pump is used to maintain organs for transplantation as they are ferried from donor to recipient. Furthermore, it was this work that laid the foundation for our understanding of extracorporeal perfusion leading to the development of the heart-lung bypass machines that are now used to allow surgeons to perform intricate repairs of the heart and or even heart transplantations. The very same procedures that would have likely saved Lindbergh's sister-in-law. There are many aspects of Lindbergh's life and legacy that remain controversial, chief among them his sympathetic views to the rise of Nazi Germany, as well as belief in the notion of eugenics. Indeed, Carell also held similar views and hoped that one day his discoveries could be used to drive the notion of immortality. Still, in separating the art from the man, it is difficult not to appreciate this moment in Charles Lindbergh's life where he desperately sought to try and save the life of a member of his family. It is hard to say how this particular meeting shaped the directions of these two lives. And for more salient insights, I would recommend David Friedman's book, The Immortalists, which dives deeply into the individual motivations of these two men. Regardless, it is clear that this purposeful intersection of discipline and history led to a breakthrough. This is Curative Design, and I'm Erwin Matthews.